So thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm super happy to be here. And also, um, this is kind of one of my first trips after these three years of Corona, where I just went to some place and give a talk and have some chat with people. So be nice to me so that I get positive impression and then not start hiding back again once in video conferences. Control. Okay, so I will talk about a recent paper from us. And um, as the first disclaimer, of course, I'm not doing this alone. That this is part of a group of researchers, and most importantly, this is part of uh, part of the work that Thorsten Eichhofer and Erwin Kliering did. They are kind of shared first authors. This paper will appear in August at USNIC Security, and you are the first ones to hear a talk about this. It's my version of the talk, so I guess the USNIX talk will be more serious and more organized, of course, and much shorter also. Uh, um, but this this is kind of the um, the topic. And what's interesting and why I really like this talk and why I, I'm also a little bit excited is there's so many applications of machine learning and security, right? Malware detection, intrusion detection. Now there's adversarial examples for image with computer vision. But something that we all like a lot is peer review. Everybody likes these reviews. And why not look at this domain and see whether we can do something interesting there? And I mean, I guess nobody here in the room is researching peer review, but I guess all of you are using it, right? As kind of the main, yeah, what is, what is on my slide? The main instrument for quality control and selection of publication. Yeah? It's, no, but seriously, it's, the only technique that I'm currently aware of that we use in science to do quality control of research. And we all hate it, but I don't know any better alternative. And what, how does it work? Well, it works in the way that you submit some scientific work to a conference or a journal. And then this journal invites other people, your peers, and they are experts in the topic of your submission. And then they can say something about your submission. They can say it's a good submission, it's a bad submission, it needs to be do this and that and things like that. And I, I think I don't need to talk about all of these weaknesses. We all know them and we all know of these reviewers that are so de, um, so uh, de demotivational in the security community. But underneath there is this instrument peer review. And the very first step of any review process is what we will be looking at today. And this is called the paper reviewer assignment. And this means paper comes in and it is assigned to a group of reviewers and they do the review on this paper. And traditionally, like 1950 or so, uh, when you were submitting a paper to Nature or maybe the, 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 paper, the journal had a different name at that time, um, the editor of the journal would manually select reviewers for your submission. So he or she would go into their, I don't know, box of notes and say like, oh, this is a paper about something. I know three people that also know this topic very well, so we can just assign them and we're done. Now, this is not what's used today. Today in security, I guess all of you that have been reviewing know this, we use something that's called bidding. And this means the reviewers go through the list of all papers and then they can place bits. Like I want to review this paper. I don't want to review that paper. I want to review this paper more than another one. Yeah, I'm personally really giving different scores. So like my personal flavor, and then I kind of try to find the optimal selection of papers. Now, unfortunately, this whole system, traditional manual assignment and also building doesn't scale very well. And in some areas of computer science where there's really hot research, it doesn't work at all. And so here I'm showing you the number of submissions to three conferences in the last years. And yeah, let's just pick, pick, the, pick the top one. So this is New Rips, the number one machine learning conference. And they received in the last year, 10,000 submissions. It's not a joke or so. It's not that I made a mistake. They get 10,000 PDF documents submitted for review. And I, as a joke, I, I, I wrote, if I would spend three seconds per paper just to read the title, I guess three seconds is okay for a title, it would take eight hours to go through these submissions. Yeah, And it's clear nobody's doing this. And as you, I guess somebody from the machine learning community here, 
No, okay. So us, we normal people, we live in this, there's a small blue bar at the bottom, can you see it? This is the world of normal people. So this is, for example, computer security. So we have rarely more than 2,000 submissions to a conference. Maybe we have 1,500 for using security or for CCS or Oakland, but we are not at this level yet in our community. But I, I don't think that this might be forever like this. Maybe also our submissions will increase, but at least other communities have this problem. CVPR is a computer vision conference. It's not a machine learning conference. They also have like 9,000 submissions, uh, or yeah, not exactly, 8,000 submissions per year. So some smart people thought about this and not just recently, but already 10 years ago or even more. So there was a first paper in 2010, surprisingly at the conference New Ribs. So it's like kind of, they developed a solution for their own conference. And the idea is we use machine learning to do the paper to review assignment. So we make this manual process completely automatic. Papers are submitted, papers are automatically assigned. And there have been several proposals, but there are two systems that are currently the standard in conferences. One is TPMS, the Toronto paper matching system. And the other one is Autobit, which is just a clone of TPS. So if, if I'm honest, there are only two systems. There's only TPMS and an open source clone. And since TPMS is closed source, we work with the open source clone of it. Um, and it's used by these large conferences every year to automatically assign papers to reviewers. And technically, this approach works on an interesting concept called a topic model or topic modeling. And, and maybe I hope you don't know this because I will shortly describe what kind of technique this is and how it is used to, to, to generate this matching between topics and expertise. Yeah, and let's just look at TPMS and, and how it is uh, working. So first step, very simple, I get in a PDF document. This is already a problem for most people in natural language processing or other domains because we don't get in a text document like a Word document or Markdown or text. We get this nasty PDF, so first we do some extraction, pre-processing, we remove some words that, that don't, don't matter, and we represent our text or paper as a sequence of words. And then we compute a so-called back of words representation that is a very simple representation. We create a vector space, and in this vector space, each dimension is associated with one word. So if there's one word, wait, I have an example. If there's one word massive, for example, yeah, and it appears 61 times in our paper, then in the corresponding dimension, we would have 61. And if there's a word crypto, but it doesn't appear in our paper, then we have a zero in this dimension. And the vector space is super, super large, and it's created by all words that are interesting to us. 10,000, 100,000, yeah? And as a result, we can take any possible paper, map it to this vector space, and now we don't have papers anymore, but we now have vectors. That's very good. Okay, and now we can also say, what could be a topic in this kind of representation? And a very simple idea to define a topic is to say, um, a topic consists of words that are co-occurring. So if I talk about fruit salad, I will talk about bananas, oranges, apples, but I will not talk about uh, sport boats, for example. This is not related to the topic fruit salad. And this means we can look for these kind of sets of co-occurring words. And these, these sets, they can overlap. So if I have the topic fruit salad and I have the topic uh, fruit ice also, many of these words overlap, but the ice topic has also ice in its set, whereas fruit salad has the word salad in the set. Yeah, you see? So it's not completely that we kind of partition our world into topics, but instead we represent everything by mixture of topics. And there exist different algorithms to do this. I'm not going to talk about them today, um, but one of the most popular ones is called LDA, Latent Dirichlet Allocation, and it's used in TPMS. The important point here now is last. Each paper is now described not by a topic, 
but by a mixture of topics. Yeah, so it's not that I say it's only about fruit salad, but maybe my paper about fruit salad is also a little bit about peeling oranges. And this is another topic that I like. Yeah, so, and in, in principle, I get a mixture of these different topics, and this creates something that is then called a topic space. This is not necessarily a vector space, but it's a space where all these papers are distributed. And wait, wait. And for example, there could be the orange bubble, which is crypto and key. There could be the magenta bubble with the tech and model, purple. And there could be the green world with code and analysis. And some of these topics overlap and some don't. Crypto is completely alone in its world and everything else. No, no, no. <laughs> no, in fact, there's many overlaps, right? And um, this is how you, you kind of describe the papers. So let's come to the matching. So now we can do a matching and in fact, it will be rather simple. So what we do is we take a paper and we map it to this topic space. And this means the paper is now represented as 10% crypto, 20% attack something and 70% analysis of code. I think such a paper could even exist, right? The topics, however, are simplified. Huh? The real topics are much longer, have many different ones. And then I can take the reviewers, and for each reviewer, I collect papers from him or her. The papers that the person has written in the last two years, for example. And then I do the same thing for the papers from the reviewer, with the only difference that I put all of the papers together into one backdrop. So my Reviewers also will become points in the topic space. And then I can have a reviewer here. And this reviewer is maybe 80% crypto, 20% attack, and 0% analysis of code. And determining a paper reviewer assignment is now just the same as computing a similarity in the space. And the more similar someone is to the paper, the more likely he or she will be assigned to the paper. Here I said one, two, three. This could be our three reviewers, right? One, two, three. And note that reviewer two has no expertise in the topic that is the one of the paper, but in my example, this happened like this. Okay, this is essentially the core of the Toronto paper matching system. Um, there's more. For example, there's also load balancing. Not every person can every review paper, every paper, because if they have already five papers assigned, they cannot do more. And also there could be conflicts of interest. So somebody might not be allowed to review a paper, but we have this in the paper. We're not modeling it here. And we assume that if somebody is similar to a paper, he or she reviews the paper, which is a good, uh, I think it's a good idea. So to illustrate this, to make it a bit uh, kind of wake you up in, in the first third of the talk, you can do this for researchers. And we did this for many researchers from the security community. And so when I prepared the talk, I said, maybe Martin and Martin were in the room. So I can kind of look at their topics. And in my personal opinion, at least for Martina, I can say the topics are not so bad. We can have a look. So the first one is F Android. Application permission user. These are stamped, so the words are a little bit truncated. I think this is all around Android application analysis from some perspective. However, it's not necessarily about malicious applications because this is the second topic with this malware detect malicious sample feature. And the third one is fuzzing execution. I don't know how this feels, but it's only 8%. And for Matteo, I yeah, I'm still struggling with the first one. So we talked a few minutes ago, we talked about Bitcoin, payment, blockchain, transaction contracts. We talked about portfolio model secure messaging systems. Yeah, but I'm still unsure about random signature and secure means. Now I understand why you get the weird uh, user for journals or on the crypto stuff. Yes. But I, I, even though I cannot perfectly match this myself, I have the feeling all of these words are quite crypto method, formal method related. And I mean, maybe this also shows you these are not perfect, these topics, but they are also not completely random. Okay, and when we I knew that I, I, I learned about this system already in 2010. So I, I 
maybe I was even at the talk, not sure. I'm not so old, but theoretically 2009 or something. No. Um, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, at least I knew about this and with the increasing number of conferencing adopting this, of course, our thought war was, yeah, okay, we attack this approach and we write a paper that selects its own reviewers. This was our kind of job. And wait, do I have? No, yeah, exactly. And the idea is uh, straightforward. I mean, we, we need to make small changes to our paper so that it somehow moves in the topic space. And um, here's what we want. We want to make these small uh, changes and we want to make them in a way that either a reviewer is kicked out, someone we don't like, or we get a new reviewer in, somebody that we already paid money so that he or she accepts our paper. However, we want all of these changes to be minimal and not suspicious. I mean, we could, we could write a paper from scratch and select the reviewers just by hand, but this would not be our paper, right? We have this, as you all have, we have this paper that we want to get accepted. There's our hard blood in this paper, but people don't like it. So maybe we can use this, but then we need to use minimal changes only. So here's the idea in, in a picture. So we would just move to some different place and then the ranking would change. And also in this example, there would be a new reviewer in the purple area and one reviewer in the green area would have been kicked out. And that's been moving in the space. And then we thought, well, how hard could this be? I mean, <laughs> there's, there's like adversarial machine learning is one of the most hyped topic in security research of the last years. It's, uh, maybe you cannot imagine how hyped this topic is, but it's, it's like blockchain. But maybe even, even worse, it, it's, there's, there's like thousands of papers published every year on this topic. Really, there's a Nicolas Canini, a famous uh, researcher from Google. He has a web page tracking these papers and I'm not making this up. It's like a thousand papers a year. So it means every day, today, three papers have been published on this topic. And we thought, okay, we just need to find the papers with this topic uh, model thing and apply it and we are done and maybe we send it to a small conference because it's so obvious. Turns out we could not use any of the previous work because 99% is concerned with computer vision and the remaining part, they completely ignore practice. And let's look what matters in practice. So the first thing is that if we move in the topic space, many papers move in the topic or feature space, we get a new vector. And this is a vector containing topics, 20% fruit salad, 30% fruit ice. But there's no mapping that goes back to our original paper. We could generate a new paper, but there's no principled way of changing topics or words in a paper. And it, you can even, you could we even prove that this cannot exist because this is a, this is just an ill-defined setting because you throw away half of the paper or even more, you just preserve the words and then later you want to get back all the structure and content and grammar, no. We knew this, but this is what we didn't do is that we tried to make changes to a paper and like add a few sentences. So we had actually a bachelor season and the student was working on this and I said, it's not so hard. And he was adding sentences to like even thread things to the papers. But unfortunately, you cannot just add words to a paper. You always add other words as well. And also you need to create context for your words. When you talk about fruit salad in a paper about this theme, you need some, you need a new section. You need to start and say like, okay, we have talked so much about roast beef. Now it's time to talk about fruit salad and things like that. And you will always introduce other words in this kind of changes and they create side effects. And then you cannot control your movement anymore. So whenever we try to move to some point, we never ended at this position. And what the bachelor student in the end did, he had an appendix and in the appendix, there were just lists of words. <laughs> Was a bachelor thesis. Was okay. I mean, he, he really spent like a lot of time, did many experiments. Uh, but he said, what really works is at the end have like ten thousand words, uh, then it, the topic changes. Okay, so we came up with a new idea, and this is mainly, I would say, the work of Dawson and Erdin. And the idea was that 
we cannot work in one of these worlds alone. We, can we cannot change the paper and know what's happening, and we cannot work in the topic space and know what's going to be in the paper. So we have to alternate back and forth between these two worlds. Um, so this means we do some kind of search in the topic space. And this, the search generates suggestions. Yeah, it's, so it's not like really a, it's not like an order or a request. It's more like I would recommend that you add the word crypto to your paper. Then we have some transformations that can add words plus side effects. And then we return and we get back a new position. But this might not be the position that we're looking for. And since we have this kind of non determinism, and side effects that we cannot control, we use the so-called beam search. Beam search means we're not just going always in one direction, but we're trying out 10 different solutions and then pick the best. So it's a variant of the beam search, right? It's a bit like beam nothing. You know what I'm talking about? It's a simple optimization technique where you try different things, then you pick the best solution, and from there, you try another case things and then pick the best, so you move forward in that direction. So when I, it's, yeah, I'm not sure, do you watch German TV? Who watches German television? Okay, so this, it's a test. So when I thought about this for the presentation and I knew that maybe it's not, I'm, I don't need to be completely serious, so it's not an ERC interview or so. I noticed that there's a German trash TV show called Sommerhaus der Stars. And you haven't seen it. Yes, no, you wouldn't raise your hand. <laughs> so it's really trash TV. I watched it once in 2018, but I watched it and they had a game and the game was exactly our algorithm. I noticed this in Aachen. So these are couples. The man is blinded and needs to drive through some streets and the woman needs to navigate but cannot drive. And because of the stereotypical setting, of course, it doesn't work because the man always drive and then it's kind of programmed to, to lead to, um, to trouble. But in principle, this is exactly how we proceed. And also this, this idea that the, the navigation, the navigator only makes suggestions because in this case, she doesn't know exactly how far he has to turn the steering wheel. She can just say little to the left. And this is exactly say, we like say little more of the word crypto <laughs> and see, right? Okay. This was the only funny slide. Okay, so how do we do this now in our approach? Um, the first thing is that we construct for each reviewer not only the topics, but we con 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 construct um, a probability model of his or her words. So we can draw words from the probability distribution for each person. And these probabilities are computed from the topics of the person. So this means that I can draw words that are, are very um, frequently used by this person in the text. And we remove some words that are used by many reviewers. So for example, we would throw away crypto, I guess, because if we would use crypto as a word, we would automatically move many reviewers into our um, proximity. And if we would remove crypto from a paper, we would also throw away, throw away many uh, reviewers. So we try to keep uh, I said unique words or unique. We try to keep words that are used by very few reviewers because then we can move um, with less time through the space. And then the search is almost exactly like I, like I described. This, this algorithm makes small steps, and these steps are just suggested increments and decrements. So we draw from the probability distribution if we want to move towards a uh, reviewer, we add words from his or her probability distribution. If we want to move away, we draw words and try to remove them from our paper. And there's two constraints. I, I did not put the, the formulas here. So we want first to have an L1 constraint on the changes. This means the number of total words that are changed should be low. Right? Clear. Yeah. And this can be nicely described, described mathematically as an L1 norm, but I can also be described in words. And we have an L infinity constraint, so this means no word should be very, very frequent. What the student, for example, did in the bachelor thesis, put all the words at the end, he had a very large L infinity norm because there were a few words that were like 1,000 times in the paper. And we want to push this 
largest maximum frequency we want to push this down and the maximum change as well. Okay, then let's look at the transformations. So in principle, there are many different ways of changing words in a PDF document. <laughs> Please don't think of Adobe Acrobat or so. I mean, I'm talking about LaTeX and we kind of compile it, right? We are not, we're not going to be mad. So we assume that the attacker has the LaTeX source and he or she is kind of compiling it and now can make changes to the source code. Um, and we found out that in principle, there are two classes of changes that you can do. And one are these format and encoding changes. And I would say they are like dirty tricks that you can do. And the other one, one like the sophisticated text transformations where you really change your sentence. And we played with both because they have different properties. The text changes, they are very stealthy. And maybe you cannot see them because it's just the, 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 the words are changed in a way that the semantics are largely preserved. So I replace, I don't know, fruit salad by sweet salad or something like that. And when you read it, it's not obvious that something is wrong. Whereas the dirty tricks you will see is are really dirty tricks. So where do the dirty tricks come from? They come from the fact that PDF is a very complex format and you can do all sorts of things with PDF. And there are many things that you can do we started with one and already worked very well. And this one thing that we look at is accessibility features. So maybe you know that if, if you prepare an image for the web, you are kindly asked to also add an alternate text to this image so that maybe people that are impaired, vision impaired, or some people that are, are reading the web with some uh, software, that they can also see what's on the picture. And there's a nice package for LaTeX, and you can assign alternative, alternative text to everything. Formulas, so you have an explanation for the formula. You can also put alternative text to words. And if the document is passed, typically the parser is accessibility supported because this is a great feature. Every parser wants to have it. So the past text will unfortunately contain your alternative words. And for someone who is Visually impaired, this is great because now the images and formulas get explained. But for us, this is kind of evil because we can just remove static program analysis with uh, static program something with crypto analysis. And we can also insert words by providing alternative text for spaces. And we can also remove words by adding a space as an explanation for word. This is a dirty trick, right? And here's another dirty trick. Um, you can use homoglues. Not true. This is typically done by malware authors. And so you, you have the static program thing, but the A's are actually not A's. And once you pass it, it, it cannot match to other words like static programs. And my honest opinion, so when I first heard about homoglues, as a German, and I, I, I think we all agree here, I thought that this might be just people that are um, not commonly seeing umlaute like eh, ü, and they, they see these typical American people that say like, oh, there's some dots on it, and I don't know. Um, but the, the closer I looked into this topic, I must admit I was completely wrong. There are homoglyphs that you cannot discriminate. So here's an example for you. No, it's... <laughs> You nearly need to see it, right? So this is not made up. Yeah. So if, if I, if you can, if I can give you the PDF, then you can copy paste, and you will find out it's two completely different letters. This is the Unicode of the letters. What's the explanation? This is the Latin A, and the other one is the Cyrillic A. And the Cyrillic alphabet has an own Unicode set, and those. Characters in Cyrillic that are the same as in the letter alphabet, they are the same. And there's, there's more, it's not just A. And there exist many of these kind of homoglyphs that you cannot see in a paper. Okay. Also dirty trick, right? This is not, not science. Okay, let's move on. So basically, all these uh, alternative descriptions are also part of the 
So, okay. Yeah, the slot doesn't want to be green, you know, with the five hundred years. You know, uh, yes, yeah. I mean, on the on the on the meta level, what's happening here is that we create really two different representations of the same document. The human sees the visual uh, representation, and the human would also interpret any of these letters as Latin letters because it's a Latin, not a Latin text, but it's written in Latin letters. And um, the topic model does not never see this. The topic model gets the alternate text and the homo views. But we can also do smarter things. So we said, okay, maybe wait. Since we work with neural networks anyway, maybe we can also do some cool tricks with the help of deep learning because it's so cool. And there's one technology called virtual back models. Have, has some of you heard of it? It's, it's now standard, right? It's from 2015 or so. And the idea is that you create a also another vector space, but in this vector space, you have words. And if a word is similar to another word, it is close to this other word. So for example, king and queen are close in this representation. And you can use this to do all sorts of interesting um, analysis of text, but also you can use this to find synonyms. And what we did is we trained this model on 11,000 security papers. And then we did just a synonym replacement. So for example, rule detection is a very typical word in security papers. So it's like a topic, but you can also replace this with attack identity. And um, these words are very close in this embedding space and they do not really change the meaning. At least my, from my feeling, it's very similar, but they remove this particular typical intrusion detection topic. Or you could say x86 binary is also uh, 386 software. And we have many of these synonyms at hand, so we can kind of remove common topics if we want by replacing them from the space. And this is something that my former PhD student Erwin discovered, the bit tech transformer, surprisingly, Many topic related works are in the bibliography. And I think if you think about it, it's actually clear because in the topic, you need to, in very short, provide most of the important things about your paper. So you will have, will have these very important topic words in your paper. And nobody notices if you add one or two references to your paper or 10. And this is, I would say, it's even impossible to notice. If these are not fake references, but real references. And since we had already 11,000 security papers crawled, we also had 11,000 BibTech entries. And we're using them also for our writing, by the way. And so we just, if we want to add the word crypto and model, um, we could just go through our database of papers and add a reference to this paper from Jan Jürgens. I have never heard of it, but it's expected about and very fine cryptographic models. Depending on the stemming, this would give us the words crypto and model. It's just one reference. And even better, we found out that very often the other words on the topic also help us to move into the right direction. There's even an implicit correlation, and which is also, if you think about it, it's trivial, if you want to move into the direction of young billions, you can cite his papers. And uh, <laughs> these are the words of his papers. And, uh, okay. We, we kind of took us like a year to find this out. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's the reason why this also works well. And then, of course, we wanted to be super cool. And we also wanted to generate completely texts out of the box. So for example, we had the idea that in the related work section, we can add a new section, just like this fruit salad example. And then a learning model, a language learning model generates this text about the fruit salad. Now, the sad story, or the, not sad, but it's, I mean, when we did this a, a year ago, this was science fiction, more or less, and, it, and, and the text was really bad, and I cherry-picked the best possible examples that we could find. Now, I would say with something like ChatGPT, this is trivial, right? Every, who has access to ChatGPT? Yeah, you all have it. So you say, write me a paragraph about fruit salad, and you get a very good paragraph about fruit salad. So 
It's a little bit outdated, the slide. <laughs> but the advantage, and this is why it matters in any case, is that you can ask these models to generate text that cover multiple words. So not topics, but words. So you can say, I want a sentence that has a simple word and sync in it, or lip low in odd speaker and demont. And what we get is short paragraphs that contain a lot of the words we want to have. And so this helps us to move into the direction we want to go. Now you all can do this at home. It's really, I don't know. Yeah. You cannot imagine how much time we spend on training this model. And it's a, it's a model with 350 million parameters. It's super small, right? This is nothing but it wouldn't even run on our hardware. Okay, so this kind of yeah, brings me to the point where we have everything set and then we can try it out, but maybe we need to, to, to get a little bit control here. How do we use the different transformations? And we said, we make a simple strategy and the strategy is we always start with the most stealthy transformation, so text, and we give each transformation a budget. And uh, this budget is used during application. So if you use, you generate a sentence, it costs you, I don't know, one euro, and you have 10 euros for text generations, like of chat. And, and this means that at some point you are you exhausted the budget, and then you, you move to the, to the next transformation, which also has a budget. And encoding and format tricks are only used if the text uh, budget is um, used up. Yeah, so for example, 10 synonyms, 10 references, 10 generations. We also had 10 spelling mistakes as another trick. So we had these kind of, I think we have like eight or nine different transformations. All of them have a budget. And then we have two parameters called the attack budget. This is how, how many things we do in general and the number of switches. So how often we go back and forth between topic and feature space. Yo. And now, how do you evaluate this? Um, when we submitted this to a conference, all of the reviewers wrote, I hope you didn't prepare this on our submission here because otherwise we need to reject you. And of course we said, no, we would never do this in the real world. We are only simulating this attack. So we simulated the IEEE symposium on security and privacy in 2020. We also simulated Newsnake security 2022. A lot of work to get all of these reviewers to crawl your profiles. Um, so for each PC member, we collected 20, 20 top papers from Google Scholar. If the person is not on Google Scholar, we did it by hand. Okay. And then we needed submissions. And at first we were a little bit scared because we would need thousands of submissions. But then we found out we can, for the moment, ignore load balancing and this pressure and we look at the moment where just one paper is assigned to reviewers. And this means at this moment, we only need one paper. And therefore we could start with 32 papers um, that were on AXA and that had source code. So we could make changes. And these are accepted papers to open to security 2020. So we also by design used papers that got accepted because we didn't want to show examples where uh, yeah, can you imagine, right? This, it's better this way. And the assignment is then done in our experiment, with, not with top three, but with top five reviewers, as it has been in 2020 at the conference. Yeah, and we did this for white box and black box attacks, and I will tell you in a moment what this means. So we started with white box scenario. White box means the attacker knows the topic model. So maybe the attacker is part of the PC or maybe the attacker is the PC share. Doesn't make sense, but let's assume to start with an attacker that knows exactly the topic model. And then we try out the different attack budgets and number of switches. And if the bar reaches the top, this means we can select or reject an, a reviewer perfectly. And um, yeah, the exact numbers are not 100%, but 99.8. So this means if you are the attacker and you have the topic model, you can perfectly remove or select reviewers. However, if you just want to do it with text changes, this is the blue bar, 
then you can only change the reviewers in half of the cases. But then you're also super stealthy, right? So this means for, for you in the room that are more on the stealthy side, you can select reviewers in, I would say, half of the cases. For the others that are more risky, um, you can select reviewers in all cases. But would this change if the attacker does not know the problem model? So we didn't know this. And we had the naive assumption that this would not change at all because we, we also simulated the attack. So we simulated this conference. So where's the difference? This is already a black box attack. No, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, so it turns out when we conduct a black box attack, and we do not use the exact same, same training data, but just 70% of the original training data. So instead of taking 20 papers, we only took um, 13 papers, 14, 14 papers, 20 papers. So we were missing a little bit, yeah? And we thought this, maybe this doesn't matter. People are writing the same papers over and over again. And what you can see in this plot is the success rate in the black box scenario. In one year means that we have trained one model using 70%. The success rates became a lot lower. And what happened is that these models are non deterministic. And so if you have slightly different training data or you have a slightly different seed for the non determinism, you don't get the same topic model. So we made something simple. We just trained the model again and again on the same data, but with different random seeds. So in the end, we had eight topic models. And surprisingly, if we were to attack these eight models in parallel, our attack would also go through to the target. Yeah, so, so this means for you, you need to invest a little bit more time and train multiple models on your computer at home to kind of deal with this non-determinism in the topic models, yeah? So if they go if their model is better than now, or the decorum can also be a case parallel visibility? We don't know. Okay. Yeah, maybe it's good that we don't know, but I mean, what we said for this, for this plot is, it seems that the curve is somehow um, saturating, converging, and when you notice this converge, yeah, no, 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 you don't, no, no, and then you need to have some probes to come. Yeah. No, the attacker will never. That's, but that's good news. But there's another problem. Then we thought we were done, but it turns out we are not done because this kind of non determinism, non determinism, is also present on the side of the conference systems. So if they train again their model with a different seed, they also get different results. And I hope I'm not destroying your belief now in these TPMS and so, but this is a non-deterministic system with a random component. And this means if you submit to the conference, some part of the assignment is due to randomness. I mean, it's randomness anywhere. But here we took one of our best attacks and we submitted it at no simulator. We sent it to eight simulated conferences, learned from the exact same training data, but with a different initial seed for the topic model. And the blue lines indicate that the attack was successful, and the white lines indicate that it was not successful. And you can see, wait, did, do I have a, yeah. So in this case, so in the real black box, super realistic special case, this would mean that we only get every third paper through. So for our group, this is not effective enough, but since you are many security researchers here and submit so many papers, maybe you can try out, right? Because every third one gets through. If you're wondering about the light, light blue bars, the light blue bars are cases where the reviewer was already assigned. Because there's so much randomness. Sometimes the reviewer was already there. So it was like, okay. Good. And then the last one, and then we're through. So what's missing now is, are these papers very visible? Can you spot these mistakes? Can you spot the references? Can you spot the homoglyphs? Can you spot the um, uh, accessibility feature? And we did an experiment and it was a little bit evil, but we had to do it that way. 
And so we've, we found out that if you say to security people, something is wrong with this paper, find it out, that they will come back with a list of things that are wrong with the paper, always. Because this is how security people are in their mind, right? Would also work with everybody here. But if you will say to them, can you do a small mini review for the paper? They will say, like, oh, I'm not interested. And you say, please, please, please. Um, we asked people that do reviewing, so it was very hard to find 21 people, but they got people, a paper from us and that they were asked to write a short summary paragraph what is happening in the paper. And we throw them away in these summary paragraphs because this was actually not the purpose. The purpose was that after we had, after they had done the mini review, we asked them, how do you rate the literature quality? Or how do you rate the overall writing quality? Or how much is paper manipulated? And blue is un unmodified, red is modified, and there's no real significant difference. Maybe the writing quality is a little bit worse for these, maybe because of the synonyms and somebody's talking about the tech identification all the time. Well, it should be true, I think. But overall, this is here in the lower part. Nothing was spotted. And interestingly, some people also suspected that something was modified. So this would be a rating of four here. But they did this in the same amount also for unmodified people. Typical paranoia security people. Now, if you say, was this modified? Yes, was modified. OK, so this brings me to the conclusions. Ah, it's a long talk. So there's like two conclusion slides. First thing is, what are we doing now? I mean, I made this kind of a funny story, but it, the truth is that this looks like a vulnerability. So there are different, different possible defenses, and maybe some have already been mentioned. So one thing is, we start with the metrics. If we are more careful with PDFs, and maybe we do something like sanitization or anomaly detection, we would spot all of these attacks because they are anomalies and they're extremely strange in their content. If you're smarter, you could even do something like OCR. So you could take a photo of every page from the PDF and then use optical character recognition to see what character is shown. And then it doesn't matter whether there's accessibility or who Google is. However, for the text transformations, I don't know any reasonable solution yet. There is some work on detecting chat GPT generated text. I hope you know about this when you write your papers. But since we use this only rarely, and, and our model is not watermarked, this is the this is the only for uh, the only thing that is worth maybe training it. Our model is not watermarked. We have control of it. But still, even if this would be watermarked, we could use other terms. We contacted the TPMS developers and we contacted the Autobit developer. They had a very fruitful exchange. They were like super great research. And then they were like, yeah, but we don't have time for this. And scientists are honest. And if scientists are not honest, the whole system is broken. Which I guess this is okay as an opinion, but it doesn't work with the paranoia of security people. At least so this is why I have this personal take at the bottom. And I think it's not okay this way. And one reason, I don't want to motivate you to do this attack, but one reason is you don't need to completely move to the other side with your paper. You could just move a little bit into one direction and this would increase your chances of getting reviewers you like. And if there's some community that hates your work, and I guess, and I'm not sure, but at least I know there are some communities that don't like certain work. And if you would move away from them by adding a little bit of other words or removing some of the words they, they like, this gives you an advantage, an unfair advantage, right? And this is, this is fraud and yeah, this is scientific misconduct. This would, you, yeah, you would be, this would be public. You would be reported to the publisher, ACM, it would be reported to the university and you would be fired just so that I have also sketched the consequences for you <laughs> in case you try. I mean, it's really fraud, but it's also, I would say if you do this very carefully, it's, it's not noticeable. And I think this, we should do better. Okay, and then the summary, maybe this, this that, that what, what you saw and what's kind of on the, on the more broader perspective, I think this is an interesting attack because it, it, it follows a hybrid approach 
it does not work only in one space. And this is in contrast to, I would say, 99% of what is currently published. We're not the only ones doing similar, similar approaches, but if you want to, if you want to evade a malware classifier, or if you want to uh, do other things with text or with uh, structured information, um, very likely you have to do something similar because your changes have side effects. Um, and I think what also maybe is motivate you, um, there are these millions of papers on computer vision, and I guess you can write more of them, but this was a machine learning system sitting in front of all of us for 10 years. It is used for, I think, five years, and nobody looked at it so far. And I bet that if you all think a little bit off the beaten path, we will also find machine learning, maybe not the super cool open AI machine learning system, but maybe small, small machine learning system. But I guess they are also there, right? And if we think about where they could be, maybe they are somewhere, then we could do interesting attacks that also get accepted to conferences. 